Okay, so tonight we're going to look at the more holistic point of view on uh, gardening because what we tend to do when we're growing vegetables, especially vegetables, is we don't let them flower, do we? Think about it. Lettuces never flower, carrots never flower, beetroot never flowers, unless you're trying to see, save seeds. We stop them. We eat them when they're still young, they're still fresh, so they don't get pollinated. We're doing the bees out of their work, basically, aren't we? We're doing the beneficial bugs out of their work as well. So what do we need to do? And we get the wrong type of bugs and beetles and beasties coming and eating our crops. So we sit and moan about raccoons. They took 40% of my corn crop last year in one night. <laughs> but I don't have deer. Thank goodness. The deer have all come into the city. They've left the, they've left the farms. So that was good. It was really good. But, uh, you know, we, we need to look more holistically at what we're doing. And that's why we're looking at bees, bugs, birds, beneficials, and companion plants. So companion planting and whatever. This little chappy, everybody knows a chickadee. He's your number one bird for eating bad bugs. He's a wonderful creature. Those flowers are just ordinary mallows, the, the, the wild mallow. They're, this is actually at my, my home, this, this picture on the, on the right. Um, that's Coreopsis next to it, and that's the greenhouse behind it. And I grow those, well, I don't grow those mallows. Those mallows grow for me, but they are wonderful as companion plants. So I put them in my vegetable patch as well. That's not the vegetable patch. Okay, so let's get going because we're going to run out of time. We've started a little bit late. Hi, Hannah. Okay, so who are we and what are we fighting? We're not fighting. We're just trying to help our plants grow better. Okay, so we've got four-footed beasties. I told you about the mouse last week. For those who weren't here, uh, I live in a very old house and we have mice in the house. And uh, one mouse had helped himself to all my pepper seeds. Couldn't understand why the pepper seeds weren't growing. Went right through the flat of pepper, what supposedly pepper seeds, and found that said mouse, who's now moved off to a barn, um, has actually, had actually eaten all my pepper seed. So, bugs, caterpillars, nematodes. Nematodes, you probably might not have heard of. Um, they are microscopic. You need a virtually an electron microscope to look at them. Um, but they are very dangerous around your roots, some of them. So you do have beneficial nematodes as well. And obviously, weather-related problems, which is what we hit last year. I was listening to George on my way in this morning, George Scott. Everybody's questions. What about <laughs> tomatoes and blight? OK, right. What he said was absolutely right. Crop rotation is vital. If you can't, if you've got absolutely nowhere else to plant them, use your pepper spray, use your Bordeaux spray, and use your other sprays to try and get that blight, because it does, it comes back year after year, and it's actually sitting in your soil right now. OK, so the weather-related problems, fungi, moulds, and mildews. Um, we'll get onto those later. This picture on the strawberries, I'm sure you've all seen the strawberries. You can buy them in the shops, and they're going like that. That is known as botrytis, and it's a very regular mould, unfortunately. Now, some of these moulds are carried by bad bugs, so that's or, or added to. The problem is added to by bad bugs. That's why I put these in. OK, four feet and bandit ways. I'm sure everybody recognizes all of those. And the top two are moving into the towns. The mouse has always been there. He's, he's, he's been centuries long. I read a book called The Common Stream by Roland Parker. It was about um, a little village in Cambridgeshire in England. They've done some very, very solid research on the sociology of this place in the Middle Ages. And the main problem in the granaries, mice. So they've been around. And of course, Mr. Porcupine, oh boy, does he love squash. <laughs> and as for Mr. Raccoon, he'll eat anything, but corn is his favorite. And of course, the deer will just graze on anything that's green. So um, apart from physically Getting rid of these guys, there's not an awful lot you can do, but if you plant the three sisters method, which is your corn, your pole beans, and your really hard leaf squash together, if you're growing out in the open, not in a nice deer-fenced spot like this one, 
um, you'll find that the deer and the raccoons do tend to shy off a little bit. I won't say that they shy off completely, but raccoons do not like walking over squash, squash plants. And the, the hairier and the nastier and the, the pricklier, the better. Or get a whole lot of yucca plant, which is um, a South American plant that sends up a big spire of white flowers and plant those right round. But that's expensive because yuccas... Um, I've got one at home and it doesn't do terribly well. It, it doesn't like this weather particularly. It doesn't like the, the, the cold. They grow out in the desert, so they don't like being very wet. And um, I looked at one in Scott's nursery last year and they were about $55. And I thought, no, I can't do that. So um, anything spiny is good. OK, here are your top three bad bugs. The one on the left is the Colorado potato my favorite beetle ever. They took my entire potato crop out last year. They didn't eat my eggplant, though, because that's the thing. Those are the two things that they really go for, potatoes, eggplants. At the top, we've got the grown-up, the male, uh, well, hermaphrodite, so male and female look like that. At the bottom, I'm sorry, these aren't terribly... There's no way of switching off the, that set of lights, is there? So that this could be a bit brighter. I don't want to switch off everybody's light. Yes, brilliant, that's better. Right, so Colorado potato beetle. The juvenile looks like that, and you'll normally find those underneath the leaves on your potato plants. And they will destroy. That's actually, on, I think that's more likely to be on, yeah, it is. It's on an eggplant, that lot there. But best thing for them, hand pick them off and squash them or drown them. Flea beetles, you won't see very easily. They are minute. They are really tiny. But you'll see their the markings. That's um, on a brassica. Any of the cabbage family, they tend to absolutely murder. And they will also go for things like kohlrabi leaves. Um, and they make nice little holes. But they are a pest. Um, but they're not, because they're so small, they're not that destructive. But they are still a nuisance. And then the one on the right is your friend, the cucumber or squash beetle. And the best I can offer on that is cover your squashes, cover your cucumbers with either horticultural uh, fleece, which is that white linen type stuff, or plastic or whatever, until the cucumber and squash beetles period, which is fairly early in the season, has passed. Because once that's passed, if you can get your cucumbers past this, this period, then they will grow, and there'll be no problem. But uh, they will make a nice little series of lace leaves out of your cucumber leaves, or your squashes. So cover them up if you can, plastic. Um, and don't try not to put the plastic straight onto the plant, because it will, the sun will burn, especially through clear plastic, it will actually burn the leaves. So make a little sort of cage of twigs or whatever, but make sure that you've got it right down into the ground around the plant because otherwise they'll come up through the, the bottom. And Colorado potato beetle comes up through the ground. So, now somebody, uh, I think it's this lady. Where is she? Um, Sally. Great Garden Companions. This is a super book. It really is. This is the book I'm really using tonight. Um, she suggests that if you're growing potatoes and you want to get Colorado potato beetle out, put straw over your potato plants. Especially if you're digging in and you're putting them in a trench. Put straw in your trench and it, it tends to, I won't say it stops the potato beetle because nothing stops a potato beetle. I've got a wonderful collection of seed potatoes this year. I didn't get any big potatoes last year because the Colorado potato beetles took my plants out. So, but she suggests straw and interplanting with onions and beans because they are repellent crops, which we'll get to in a minute, um, and they will stop. The, the smell of them, uh, of these two plants, actually tends to say to the Colorado potato beetle, you don't like this place, get out. Okay, so those are your top three damaging bugs around here. So moving on, caterpillars and slugs. Mm. 
Slugs, okay? There are two ways of dealing with slugs. Slugs only come out at night. Uh, they will eat your hostas. They will eat virtually anything that's got a green, nice, juicy leaf. So cabbages, cauliflowers, broccoli, uh, Swiss chard, they'll go for. But there are two ways of dealing with slugs. One is to get yourself a whole lot of bantam chickens, because they <laughs> love slugs. But uh, that's a little bit difficult, A, in a community garden, and B, in the city of, of Fredericks in the midst. The other is to mix one tablespoon of sugar to one teaspoon of, a heaped teaspoon of yeast, dry yeast, in half a liter of water, and then put it in containers that are reasonably deep, sink those into the ground. The slugs will go to the yeast if you don't want to use beer. Beer's another thing, but I'm much too schmo to use beer. <laughs> I'd rather drink the beer myself. So, yeah, put that in the ground in some sort of container. I, I normally use the 500 milliliter um, yogurt pots. Put it fairly deeply into the ground. The slug will come along, smell the yeast. That's basically what it's, it's looking for. And the, the more fermented, the better. And dive in and drown. The other thing is diatomaceous earth, um, because slugs don't like going over anything that's slightly sharp feeling, um, or, or sharp gravel. You know, things like um, chicken chicken grit or crushed eggs, if you've got enough eggs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, How close do you need to put the buckets of uh, water in these? I literally go down the side of my beds. Okay. Yeah. So, you yeah, know, fairly close in. Yeah. And uh, hopefully you'll have no more slugs. Then we have the little looper who goes along, you know, the, the, the kid's <coughs> little green looper, who's the little green gentleman on the side. Oh boy, do they like cabbages. If you find a little white butterfly floating around your garden, that's its parent. Mm. And the tomato hornworm, he's a beautiful chappy. He's got the, the tail. This is the green, the green chappy on the right hand side. That's actually a tail. Well, what they call the horn is actually a little tail appendage. And that's the moth that creates them. So you won't see, because again, it's a nighttime moth, you won't see that laying its eggs but you'll certainly see the caterpillars, they are big and juicy. So these are, again, problematical beasties. And I'm sure you've all met, met cutworm before now. This fellow, come along next morning and you'll find that your plant's top is just lying on the side, bitten off. It's this chap, it's the cutworm. Now, there's a gray one like that and there's a white one as well. And you'll often find them in your compost as well. So when you're sifting your compost to put it onto your beds, just make sure that you get these guys out. Um, these guys, if you want to find them the next morning, they don't move very far away from where they've done the damage. So if you sort of go rooting around, probably about an inch or so deep around where you've got this problem. This is actually a um, corn that they've chewed off here. Uh, you'll find this guy and you'll dig him out and squash him flat because he's a pain. The other thing to prevent them, yeah, the other way to prevent them is to take a toilet roll, cut it in half, and make a collar around your plants. And that does work. I use it on a regular basis. Okay, so nematodes are invisible. They are literally microscopic. Um, and... There are some good ones and there's some bad ones. The bad ones will cause your plant to look droopy. It'll suddenly go, Bleh. and they don't recover when you water them because you're thinking, oh, well, they've, they've dried out too much. It's most likely to be nematode. And it's things like club root, which is a, a disease of most of your cabbage family, are actually nematode based. So there's not much you can do um, apart from chemicals. So just accept that they're there. Try not to grow this, those plants that have got this problem in the same place next year. Move them on to somewhere else. Because nematodes can't last forever. So at your command to combat these beasties, we have beneficial insects, we have birds, we have plants. But you do need to create space for them. 